Uh, first of all, um, I'm going to add my congratulations, uh, Bruno, for winning the Edmore Prize. Um, it's been uh, an awesome last year or so for you because in addition to the Edmore Prize, you also won the Grow New York Million Dollar Grand Prize. What does this kind of recognition mean for your company? Uh, well, uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, we had a very, very good year last year. Uh, and for me, the recognition is uh, for several things. One is maybe the why. Why are we doing that and our purpose? And I, I just uh, hinted uh, earlier about uh, the big problem we are trying to tackle. Um, and this is a recognition of that's the major, a major issue in the food chain to keep the food chain safe, but also reducing waste and feeding a population with food of quantity, but also quality. So that's one thing that I believe the, um, the, the award you know, means, but also it means that it's a recognition of the team. It's a recognition of achievement. It's a recognition of tackling a big goal that for, so far has never been uh, achieved. And I would say that's a major recognition of the quality of the team that we, we have at Hypercell. Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm going to have some, some questions about the team here shortly. Yeah. Um, but you've talked to us a little bit about exactly what uh, Hypercell does. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you can comment on why is now the right time to start and grow this company? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say today the, uh, we, we're trying, you know, in the past 20 years, there have been a lot of improvement in technology and everybody knows now what the PCR is, what uh, you know, rapid test is, so incredible, you know, uh, you know uh, next generation sequencing, DNA sequencing, a lot of, you know, improvement in technology, improvement in processes, but yet, the number of foodborne disease is not going down, it's going up. Um, and today, you still have salmonella. Now we have more infections or infestation with listeria. Every day, you have a recall on the, uh, in the news. And therefore, there is uh, now a very um, much focus from USDA, from S FDA, to try to tackle these issues. Um, and regulation is coming, and new technology uh, needs to be implemented to uh, improve the system. So that's where um, our, we believe that what we're doing is really timely. Yeah. And, I, and it, it seems to me that, you know, the, the various partners that um, you brought to the table uh, from, from all over the country, really, kind of recognize yeah, yeah. that we are at a point in time where this is important. And I think that's one of the things that I've appreciated about Hypercell's journey so far is how creative you've been about identifying partners mm. uh, to support your growth milestones. Um, mm. How did you uh, end up, I, I know the company's mm. original roots are in Georgia. Yeah, Can yeah. you talk to us a bit about how you identified the University of Illinois and Enterprise Works and the Research Park as, as yeah. potential partners for your growth? Well, I think the, the main attraction for us uh, is obviously the weather. Uh, which, uh, <laughs> uh, beside that, uh, I would say we started, our first product was in fact a product to uh, identify infectious diseases in pigs. Uh, so naturally, uh, we wanted to be closer to you know, the pig country. Uh, we wanted to be closer to the ag food, uh, let's say, um, center of the U.S., which for me is around Chicago. And also we got a tremendous help from University of Illinois, uh, Professor Law, who helped us dramatically uh, improve our technology. And also the fact that we had Enterprise Works giving us you know, a home a great lab, and Sarah Venture giving us also the fuel to grow our business. So all of that, um, it's uh, like uh, the ecosystem which was perfect for us. Sure. So I want to dig into um, the, the company a little bit um, and kind of talk a little bit about where you'd say you are as a company right now and what are the, mm. the milestones, the, the next milestones yeah. that you're looking at uh, in your growth. 
Uh, from a, it's, we we uh, were able to reach a very critical milestones last year. Uh, first one is from a technology standpoint. What we're building is a test, uh, which is as if, so everybody now, like, I can talk very openly because everybody has gone through COVID and know what's a PCR. Or so. so you know the PCR, you have to kind of, uh, you know, bleed your nose and then send it to a lab and wait for the results. So basically what we have done is that we have taken the PCR technology, but we can do it in one hour. You don't need a lab. You don't need equipment. You don't need training. Um, and that would allow the test to be done directly either at the farm or in the manufacturing plant and get the results in less than an hour before the food goes out. And that's a big shift from what it is today because uh, to have a safe food, you need to be very precise. You need to identify a very, very little amount of bacteria uh, to make sure everybody is safe. But also you want to have the results as fast as possible. And this is the difficult equation that we believe we have solved at Hypercell. Um, so we have now uh, uh, validated that test on several targets like the Salmonella E. coli. And at the same time, uh, we have built a, a strong pipeline of future customers, which is very important because for a company, you need to kind of sell products if possible. Um, and uh, we have been able to get interest from the biggest meat packers, food processors who have writ written to us letter of interest, letter of intent. Um, so now we are in the good place where we have to m now deliver you know, the product develop completely the technology and uh, go to market. Yeah. So um, I'm interested in, in learning a bit more about um, how you think about the product development milestones and the transition from essentially a, a, a prototype uh, to manufacturing yeah. as well as talking about business development. But, be, but before we do that, um, you know, one of the things that is always interesting about launching a new business is this idea that, you know, the technology is, is, is definitely better. You, you, you can prove that it solves the problem much more effectively. And yet there are cases when adoption can still be challenging. Yeah, yeah. Um, how do you view uh, your traction around adoption of the technology? Well, well this is always the uh, kind of the innovator's dilemma. Right. Because you arrive in the market with a technology that is quite disruptive. Um, and the market uh, is always hesitant to uh, change. Uh, so you have to find uh, one a door uh, that is open for you because no one is waiting for, for you, obviously. So you have to find the door. You have to find the proper people who believe in you. Get in the door and start to demonstrate that you, are, uh, you can change, that your product is reliable, and therefore after that you can grow uh, little by little. And I think we have been blessed now to have found some of these uh, you know, early adopters and uh, in some of these big companies. Um, and uh, one, one of them being, uh, I, I can't tell who it is, but um, one of these persons who was one of the prominent uh, partner in one of the biggest uh, you know, food processor company left his job and then called me and said, Bruno, I like what you're doing. Can I work with you? To, I mean, can we work together? And that's very critical in our, we are small, and we need to have that ecosystem. We can't live alone. So we have to bring the people uh, to what we are doing. We have to make them believe in what we're doing. Uh, and then to get these um, key partners early on. Um, and that's, yeah, that's really what we are focusing on right now. As you think about those partnerships, especially the, the business development partnerships, yeah. how do you strike the balance between you know, the, the partners who generally can be, are, are typically smaller, that can move a lot faster, that you can, that can yeah. adopt quicker, mm -hmm. um, that you can work with to sort of establish those mm -hmm. initial yeah. uh, order fulfillment processes, and the larger partners yeah. who ultimately will make up the, the bigger portion of your yeah. revenue growth. Yeah. Um, so let's say I worked in big companies as well as startups, so I kind of understand the dynamics also from big companies. Um, 
big companies can be at the same time um, your lifeline, but also they can kill you. Um, they can kill you by not by by purpose, but some of them are elephants. So you know, you put an elephant in a they can squ squish you, or they can because they are very slow to move, they can drain you. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I don't think you can survive without them, because they have they have the their competitive advantage. We, our, our competitive advantage is innovation. We go quick, we, we, we don't have any uh, legacy, so we can disrupt. And that's where we are good at. Big companies, they're not so good at innovation, but they are good at market presence and market access. So at the end of the day, they're probably gonna be a partner for us. But you have to be, it, it's gonna take a lot of time, and you have to be careful because it's like uh, you know David and Goliath. Um, so it's it's uh, interesting um, dynamics to navigate. Sure, and 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 clearly having having had a b background as, as as an executive in a larger organization helps with your your thinking on how to build the right strategy. Yeah. Um, I want to shift a little bit and talk about um, building your team. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, you've got a great team. You, you acknowledge their efforts in in the recognition that the, came with the Moore Prize. Yeah. Um, Having the background of uh, having grown teams as part of a larger organization and now building you know, a founding team, a, you know, uh, growing your team as part of a startup, how do you think about building a team in an entrepreneurial context? Is, are, you, are you looking for someone with a different kind of mindset <laughs> in this particular context? Um. Yes, definitely. <laughs> uh, it's a different beast, you know, uh, being in a startup. Um, so not only you need, obviously, the, let's say, the ability, the technical ability, the knowledge, the experience, uh, but there are two things that, uh, for me, are critical to have when you work in a startup. Um, first is what we call resilience. Uh, because your life is ups and downs. It's a roller coaster every day about good news, bad news, good news, bad news. You have to be able to move in that comfortably, in that uncertainty, and at the same time, uh, don't get discouraged uh, when you face adversity, uh, because eventually, if you work well as a team, you're gonna overcome that. Uh, so resilience is one key element. Uh, the other one is uh, you have to live in a paradox. And it's, um, it's called the Stockdale Paradox, and if everybody knows what it is. Um, it's the fact that you have to, in your mind, to be very optimistic that at the end you're going to prevail, but also being brutally realistic about facing what uh, the problem that you're facing today and not ignore them. And it's a duality that uh, you, you don't solve, but you have to be able to live with. So it's a different mindset. Not everybody is made, made for that because it's not always comfortable. But it's exciting because you're building something. So how many times in your life you have the opportunity to build something? That's right, and I, I imagine that will be an important part of how yeah. you um, you think about recruiting is, is selling the opportunity yeah, yeah. Uh, around building something yeah. um, uh, that didn't exist before. Um, so you're obviously at a critical point now where you, uh, you've developed your, your technology, you've got, a, you've got a product, at least a, a prototype, you've got partners who are interested in engaging on the business development side. How do you think about going from, from the prototype level to, to manufacturing. And yeah. you know there are a number of people in this room potentially who could be value chain yeah, partners. Yeah. I wonder if you can talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so now the next steps will be uh, another big milestones for us, will be to move from the prototype in the lab into uh, you know final product and then uh, market access. So for that we need, um, you know, we need manufacturing facilities, we need uh, commercial operations, uh, we need, uh, you know, software developers. We need, uh, so we still need a lot of uh, help 
to we, so we have a pretty pretty uh, you know aggressive roadmap, uh, and we have also started to identify you know, all these partners, but uh, we need more help. So whoever is willing to help us uh, is welcome. Yeah. I imagine part of that is raising capital as well. It's raising capital, yeah. You have an open fundraising round currently, yes, I believe? Yes, yes. Okay. So I think we have a, a few investors in the room. Hopefully okay, we can help so make those connections over the course of the day. <laughs> right. Perfect. So, you know, we do have um, a number of entrepreneurs uh, in the room. We've, yeah. we've got students who are at the early stages of their career and they perhaps maybe thinking about entrepreneurship. You've had an incredible career, starting with academia, working in government, working in large corporations, and now um, and you being an entrepreneur. What advice, or what do you, what, what advice do you have about how to think about building a successful career? Yeah. Okay, I would say my first advice is that don't do what I did, because it's not very, <laughs> it's not very comfortable. Um, sometimes when I look at what I've, d I've done, I kind of, I, I feel like I, I live my life at uh, reverse. So let's say the typical uh, way to, uh, to build a career from a startup is that you, you go to college, you do your startup when you're in your 30s, um, then you sell it to a big corporation, um, you participate in that big corporation for a while, then you know, you're done, you have your money, and then you give back to community, so for the public good, um, which is typically what you see. Uh, I, did, I did the reverse. So I started to give back to my community by working for the public sector for 15 years. Then I worked for a big corporation, and then I started my own company. So it's kind of a, but what I would say it's, um, it's super exciting. There is no time, there is no good time to start a company. Um, but there is always the right time to do it. But you have to know where it is and what, what you need to, and there are several ingredients that you have to have put together to be able to do that. Uh, but I would say for everybody who's listening, whatever the, and I see the, the much diversity in, uh, in age groups, I mean, there is no time that would prevent you from starting your own company. I don't know if it's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> it's good perspective. So, um, you know, it, it's good perspective in thinking about, about timing. Um, you know, however, I'd, I'd love to get your take on um, how do we think about, given, given your background, having, you know, been in government and in, in, in business, how, how do you think about what qualities make for a good entrepreneur? All right. Yes, I know. I knew that you were going to ask me that question. So let's say, um, okay, just a quick, quick question. During COVID, uh, I want to ask the audience, who uh, tried to make bread? Can you raise your <laughs> hand? Like bake bread. Yeah, come on. You, you don't be ashamed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, now, how many of you failed? To make bread, so <laughs> so I think ninety percent of you failed. Okay, to make bread, you need four ingredients. Yeah, okay, it's water, flour, yeast, and time. It's very so it's very simple. Yet, it's very complicated to do the right thing. So for me, I, I take the analogy of doing, you know, make, doing a company. You need, you need four ingredients. You need, you need a team. Uh, you need a good, I mean, good team. Well, everything has to be perfect, but a good team, a good technology, trade, which is you know, customers, and a good timing. Four ingredients, very simple, but very difficult to do. And 90% of these companies fail, like the bread. But um, when you have, the, when you are part of this, you know, hopefully everybody wants to be part of this five or ten percent, then you make something delicious that is called French baguette. <laughs> 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 
I love that. <laughs> That's great. Well, I think um, we, b b before we transition here to, um, to, 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 to Q&A, um, I think given, given my role uh, as the Director of Entrepreneurship, I'll be remiss if I didn't ask you what your thoughts are um, around you know, what, what the most important thing we can continue doing to, to foster uh, an entrepreneurial ecosystem yeah. here. Uh, as someone who's relatively new to the ecosystem and is, you know, integrated with it. Uh, well, listen, I truly believe that in, um, let's say the university here, I mean, University of Illinois is big. How many, how many students? 56,000. And, and faculty members? I don't know, several thousands, okay. Yes. I believe that there are a lot of ideas, a lot of creativity, a lot of you know, disruptive thoughts that could potentially tomorrow um, become big in the market, but we may not know that. So one thing would be f uh, to try to identify where these new potential ideas could potentially uh, be you know, useful or become a company. And once you have identified that, how to help and coach and finance and try and being willing to fail uh, by, uh, you know, because it's not obvious when you're academy, academy, you know, member of the, of the faculty to become an entrepreneur. That's not obvious and yeah. you need a lot of lot of help. So um, I think the potential is here um, from what I see and just maybe doing at scale, you know, getting faster, better, bigger. Right. That's great. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, I think we'll open it up uh, for questions uh, from, from the audience. Does anyone have any questions? You're probably thinking if you don't ask questions, we'll get to lunch sooner. I'm afraid that's not the case. <laughs> Just a reminder, you can use your QR code to send us the questions, but there is a little bit of a delay. Oh, we have one. Hello. Uh, thank you for, for uh, like, <laughs> the interesting tips. <clears throat> can you elaborate more on the innovator's dilemma when it comes to market disruption? Um, let's say the principle of the innovator's dilemma is do you go to market first uh, or do you go to market second or third, uh, meaning that the first one is usually opens the doors, um, you know, goes through the trenches, makes all the mistakes, uh, and then the second one learns, make a product better, and uses the opening that the first one has gone through to, over, you know, to overcome the, the first one. Take, take the example of Lyft and Uber. You know, the first company that did you know, tr the car sharing was Lyft. Have you, anybody here have heard about Lyft? It's very small versus Uber. Uber used what Lyft did to make it bigger at scale. So the innovators dilemma is always due, but at the same time, if there, is, there are other uh, you know, uh, examples where when you're first to market, you establish the gold standard, uh, you establish the, the uh, let's say, the, the brand, and therefore you get most of the market and the competitors is, um, have more difficulty after that to follow what you're doing because they have to overcome your situation as far as the standard that you put together. But it's always a question you ask yourselves. I believe we have time for one more question. Everybody's hungry. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, so well, with that, Bruno, this has been a great conversation. Yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you, thank you everybody. Okay.